Hello everyone and welcome to episode 17 of the Haxton Knits podcast. My name is Deanna and I'm an American living in Okinawa, Japan. This week we have the final installation of Sock Madness for the year. I revisit the Knits in Translation Knit Along and I show you the finished object for my ongoing Knit Along. So let's get started. Let's get things started with some announcements. So I have the Challenge Yourself Knit Along going on over in my Ravelry group. It is going to be running through the end of July. So if you're interested in participating in that Knit Along, you can pop over to my Ravelry thread for all of the details. At the end of July, I will put together a little prize package and use a random number generator to um, send out a prize for participation. Um, I think I'm just going to pull directly from the chatter thread, uh, no pressure, you know, no finished objects necessary. And I do want to remind you guys that I am a very small, small YouTube channel, which means that you have a much higher chance of winning a prize if you participate. So you may want to think about heading over there and updating your progress. I will update you with my progress later on in the finished objects section. Let's start things off with what's in my glass this week. This is my Morimoto Soba Ale, which somebody kindly made out of a rogue beer bottle. And you know, I know I've never actually gotten to taste Morimoto Soba Ale, so if there's any rogue fans out there, maybe you can chime in on whether it's a good beer or a bad beer. I do love some soba, so surely I'll love the Soba Ale, but I do not have beer in this glass today. What I have instead is Chuhai. Uh, this is one of my favorite drinks out of Japan right now. So this is Kirin Strong in the Prime Sour flavor. Oh, yeah, my favorite drink for sure. I think this is soju, or is it shoju? I know, like, one's Japanese, one's Korean. Either way, very easy to drink. You can get yourself into some trouble pretty quickly. Um, the sour flavor. So I don't really know, um, I don't, maybe I'm... Uh, ignorant in the ways of drinks here, but I don't know what the sour flavor really is supposed to taste like. What it tastes like to me is this. So this is um, cow piss water. Sounds like cow piss. No, cow piss water. And it is a drink made out of yogurt. And um, delicious. I don't know how to describe it. Just kind of tangy yogurt flavor, maybe a little bit lemon limey in flavor, but Another favorite drink of mine, and I think that this drink tastes a lot like that, but infused with delicious alcohol. So that's what's in my glass. This week I'm actually mixing a little bit of that and a little bit of Wata. Wata. Wata is by Orion. Uh, so this one is Kirin. This one is Orion. Orion. This one is Acai. All of which I relate to. Uh, big brands of beer here in Japan, but just big brands in general. They do sodas and other drinks. Um, and this is Wata um, <laughs> passion fruit flavor. So delicious. I mix them together. Um, actually, my neighbors have a huge passion fruit vine that's in full bloom right now and full of like big, big passion fruit. Like the ones I remember in the U.S. were kind of maybe plum sized. And these guys are like mango sized so um i have to knock on their door and see if they might allow me to liberate a couple of passion fruits off their vines all right for sock madness updates this is the last you're going to get to hear about sock madness for this year because it is over it is done it is finished uh the final round so in the final round the fastest player from each team goes against each other and they take the top three finishers as the first second and third place winners and this year the first place winner finished in 12 hours and 12 minutes so i will put a picture up of the pattern because it was the beaded pattern and this pattern is by belly button knits and um, a sad very sad. So she, um, the designer of this pattern, passed away prior to this round of Sock Madness going on. And so this is her last contribution to the Sock Madness uh, universe. And she made the choice of submitting this pattern specifically for the purpose of it being the grand finale of this season. Um, and it was a beautiful, beautiful pattern with lace and beads. More power to it. We've got a person who can finish a complete pair of socks in 12 hours, including beading and lace. It's amazing to me. Um, the second and third place finishers both finished 
just under 14 and a half hours. And I know the um, competitor for my team, she said she was one and a half socks in when they made the announcements for the first, second, and third place. So that was amazing, amazing job. So the winner was Wool Troll over on Ravelry. Um, second place was Wendebular and third place was Hobular. So go and offer them congratulations. I'm sure you'll be able to find them over on the Sock Madness group if you're interested in doing so. Um, I am whew, I'm actually relieved that the Sock Madness season is over. I don't feel um, you know the pressure to keep knitting socks. I do really want to maybe go back and re-knit some of the patterns that we did. And also now that it is over, um, I've started, my email box is starting to get flooded. Um, the can, contributors of the patterns will start putting out their patterns available for the general public and they also send you Ravelry codes if you were a participant so you could add yours to your library for future use. And so I've got all of the patterns, I, I kind of hoard them and save them in my email until the end of the year and then once they actually release the patterns I add them to my library so I don't have to keep my in inbox full. So, an excellent year. I'll put up some pictures here of all of my sock madness contributions. When it's all said and done, I didn't actually knit that many socks, but um, I certainly enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the camaraderie of the team and getting to, um, you know, compete a little bit. Like I said, it would be really, really awesome to get a local team together. So like you could have your knit night when the pattern drops and everybody knit together. But alas, that has not happened for me here yet in Okinawa. Give it time, I might be able to rally a Team Okinawa for next year. Let's move on to some finished objects. My only finished object this week is my contribution to the Challenge Yourself Knit Along. So, um, this will maybe be the last time I talk about it, maybe not. Um, I came up with the idea of this knit along because I have often witnessed people who uh, come into yarn shops to seek advice and um, get out of trouble when they've made a mistake in a pattern. Um, and I've often heard them say, oh, well, I really wanted to be knitting on it, but I, you know, I got a little lost. I didn't know what to do. And so I just put it down until I could come in and ask for help. And so what I want to do is challenge everybody out there to uh, figure it out yourself. <laughs> Gosh, that sounds rude. Uh, but you know, use your resources, use your internet, go look up how to do something. One of the things I encountered when I started doing the Master Knitter program is that I realized I had been doing a lot of things wrong. Wrong I say loosely because this is a craft and an art and you can do whatever you want, however you want to do it. But um, sometimes if you have some guidance on the right way to do a technique it makes it a little easier it makes it turn out a little bit smoother and a little more finished and a lot of skills along the way i just sort of i just wing it and hope for the best and as i started down the path of the program and like going to books and reading how to do things i realized oh man this looks really nice, this looks a lot better. And so I'm really glad that I challenged myself to do the Master Knitter program and challenge myself to go look up and research techniques that are new to me and just dive into them and not be scared. And so for me, I wanted to, um, I wanted to make things out of my weaving. So weaving is a new skill for me. I've only done like maybe three or four pieces of fabric out of, uh, off of my loom. I have a rigid heddle loom. It's a 16 inch loom. And um, I just, I really wanted to make something with it. You know, up in Alaska, I was able to just use these pieces of fabric as a nice wrap or shawl, but it was time, time to make something. So here is my finished object. So this guy was totally unplanned from start to finish. I used nothing but scrap yarn. <laughs> I had no blueprint. I had no idea what I was doing, but I made it work. I did do a lot of little internet research along the way on how to get things done. But what started out as a way to use up some scrap yarn was this bit of weaving here. And so um, all of the yarn, like I said, leftovers from other projects. I had just finished the Victoria Raffia pattern, which is a beautiful double knit scarf that I knit as a uh, stranded color work cowl. 
it had quite a bit of yarn left over and so that yarn was the Cooney Effect Garn and I decided I was gonna just take this lovely yarn and weave something. There was no plan. I um, just kind of eyeballed it. Basically I set up my loom and I um, set up a, you know a dowel to warp around and just eyeballed it. Like how, how long would this be to be a nice little wrap or a nice scarf or something like that and I warped until I ran out of yarn so the colorway for my warp was colorway ET and then I just took the other colorway which was colorway EQ and I did just simple weaving back and forth until I ran out of yarn and this is the uh, you know the final product I'll put up the picture of a beautiful scarf um, and if I were in Alaska, that would have been it. I would have had a beautiful scarf, but I am not in Alaska and I wanted to make something wearable with this yarn. Um, so my big fear, the thing that I've been putting off doing is cutting into my weaving. And it's funny because I cut my knitting all the time. I know how to steek. I'm not scared to do it. Um, but I did, so I did, I went to some YouTube videos, uh, broke out the sewing machine. I just did a simple zigzag stitch. I don't know why I've been so scared to do this for so long <clears throat> and then cut my fabric. And I hemmed and hawed and finally decided I was going to make uh, just a boxy t-shirt. And so I did, I um, you know, took out my yarn and did a simple stitch up the middle. So that original piece of fabric got cut into four pieces and I sewed those together side by side to form the main body of my sweater. For the top of the sweater, I used my um, Vogue knitting book just to make a simple crew neck. And this yarn is Juniper Moon Farms Patagonia in the cinnamon colorway. And I used this yarn for the weekender sweater. So I had a front and a back. Um, I was a little bit scared that if I just sewed the sides together that it wasn't gonna be stretchy enough to get over my head. Um, weaving is a little bit less stretchy than knitting and I was having some shoulder issues. I actually couldn't like maneuver my arm through a shirt unless it was very stretchy at the time. So I next went stash diving and got some Brooklyn Tweed Loft. And so this is the almanac colorway. It's left over from my arrows down sweater. And I just did a long strip of seed stitch. It's 15 stitches wide. And I went all the way up the side, all the way over top of the shoulder and then back down and then just sewed up until the desired size of my armhole. And that was it. I do admit that the neckline is a little bit snug. I actually, I love it. It doesn't bother me to wear it at all. I've mentioned before that I prefer a little bit of a tighter neckline, especially on knitting that tends to stretch. I hate when it starts to like kind of fall off your shoulder and not fit very well. And um, for the bind off, I just did a simple I cord bind off for both the top and the bottom. You can see my weaving is not perfect here. That's okay, I'm still new at this. And then I also just went through and kind of did a little simple whip stitch on the inside to hide the raw edges of my weaving. I only did that on the bottom edge because that's where you could see it. Here on the top, you, this is the inside. You can see just the raw edge of the weaving. Um, and this is, you can't see it at all, I'm sure, but there's a zigzag stitch right there so you can see how I secured that end. I may, I may come back and do another little whip stitch to tack down this end too, but it's really not bothering me. And I'm just loving wearing this. Um, so here in Okinawa, it is full summer, full summer. It is so hot and so humid. I'm dying. I'm living my whole life in tank tops and shorts, which you would be able to see if I weren't covered up nicely with this shawl. I've literally only covered up with the shawl because I wanted to show something knitting on my body for the purpose of recording. Um, so yeah, I even, even just a, a t-shirt may be a little bit too hot for the next couple of months. It'll do great through the fall and through the winter here where uh, I think we had maybe two days over the winter where I was able to wear an actual long sleeve knit sweater. So I think there's going to be a lot of knitted t-shirts and tank tops in my future, which of course brings me into my works in progress. 
four whips this week. I am revisiting the Knits and Translation knit along that's being hosted by Melissa over at the Knitting the Stash podcast. I'll put a link below to her channel if you want to go and check her out. But uh, the purpose of that knit along is to challenge yourself to challenge yourself. <laughs> that's my knit along is to try to knit patterns that are not in your native language. So if you don't speak Japanese, try to knit a Japanese pattern. And since I'm living in Japan and barely speak Japanese, I thought I would participate. So um, watchers of the show, you've seen this several times now. This came out of the Knit Marche uh, magazine. <laughs> I love this. So as a, as a American, you know, books are held this way and flip through, but in Japan it's the opposite. So it takes me a little while to get used to, but I'm left-handed, so it actually is kind of nice. I, I don't know, it feels, feels nice to me. So this is called the page for pullover on Ravelry, and it may be a little bit tricky to search for if you are not a Japanese speaker, because there's a whole bunch of Japanese writing in the title. So I do have that linked below. The Japanese writing I threw through the translator and it basically just means a uh, cardigan knit in straight knitting, like flat knitting, not round knitting. But this, I'm sorry, not cardigan, pullover, pullover knit in flat knitting. This is the pattern here. And of course I am gonna do it without the long sleeve. So I have a little bit of a t-shirt, um, lovely pattern. And I feel like I'm cheating a little bit participating in this knit along because um, if you know anything about Japanese knitting, it's all chart based. There's almost zero written instructions. And I'm not gonna show you the chart, but I am gonna show you. So I photocopied the, the instructions out of the book so that I could write notes and stuff. This is the backside, so you won't be able to see anything. This is the entire pattern for that pullover. <laughs> so this piece of paper has the um, chart and it gives you all the instructions you need. And then this piece of paper has all of your, um, like your gauge, your materials you're using and, um, the stitch pattern so the chart for the little stitch pattern so there's like a little schematic chart and then there's a bigger stitch pattern chart this is it this is my whole pattern so cheating a little bit in this knit along but hopefully you guys will forgive me so this project is living in this beautiful project bag which i made and i'm totally smitten with the fabric came from a local craft star store here on okinawa called takai craft heart and um i will link below the tutorial for how to make these patterns because i am um mm, i am not good at sewing but this tutorial was easy to follow. I did omit the handles in the tutorial. So if you're looking at my playlist, I have a playlist of sewing tutorials, which has a grand total of two videos in it right now. But if you see the one, if you see the one with the handles, that's, that's this one. Super easy, super easy to make, and I'm totally in love with it. So knits and translation knit along. This is Worcester Nostalgic Tweed, which is a Japanese kind of big box yarn brand. These balls are 40 grams, which is it's about as big as they get here in Japan. I don't know why, for whatever reason, everything is sold in these little teeny 40 gram balls, which means I'm gonna need about 500 of them to complete this project. I um, originally bought, I think I bought nine balls of it thinking I was going to have enough because I was leaving the sleeves off and I have completed half of this project now and needed five balls of yarn, which means I'm going to be short. I'm going to be short one ball of yarn. I went today to try and see if I could get another one and they are still sold out of this colorway because I bought them all. Um, so I'm either going to sit on this long enough for more to come in in stock. Hopefully more comes in in stock or I'm gonna make some modifications to the other half of this project. Let me show it to you. So the cool thing about this pattern is that it's knit sideways and I love it. So here is my progress. This is actually half. So half of the um, body of the sweater, this will be the front or the back half, you cast on 
here and then you knit this way um, and that's actually really nice I feel like if you're knitting this way you never hit oh gosh sorry I feel like knitting a sweater sideways is really nice because you never hit the like sort of uh, body island where you're just straight knitting for a long time because on every single row you're going to have the bottom hem, the body, the top yoke, all of that all put together. And so it just made this pattern really fun to work on. It never got boring. Um, it was super easy to memorize this stitch pattern. It's um, like a one by one twisted cable and some seed stitch. Yeah, so this, um, you will make two of these that are identical. You'll sew up the edges again, leaving uh, your armhole for your desired size and sew up the neck, leaving your desired size neck hole. And that's it, super, super simple. So um, since I'm short one skein, my thought process was I can make the next one I knit a little bit shorter, like maybe two inches shorter and kind of have one of those like high, low front backs happening. Um, and then maybe leave a little bit of a slit on the side when I sew it together. It's kind of easy to do this because there's this uh, two by two rib all the way up each side. So it's a nice little finished edge. So it's a nice little finished edge if I want to leave a little bit of a split there. So we'll see how that goes. Like I said, I may sit on this a little bit just to see if I can wait out the um, yarn shop here and see if I can get some more of this yarn. Now I admit, I can get a little bit yarn snobby. It's not a bad thing, it's fine. Um, I just, yes, I can get a little bit yarn snobby, but this yarn, I love it. It's great. It's um, Worcester is like the big box brand here in Japan. I wish I had a price tag on these, but they were super cheap and it's just been absolutely lovely to work with. Um, this, this Tweety yarn, it's gold. It's got little flecks of blue and cream and yellow and gray and black. Um, and it is 80% wool and 20% nylon. So no complaints about this particular yarn choice. I think um, probably for my giveaway, I'm gonna put together a, a, a prize package and I'm thinking I'm gonna do one skein of like a indie Japanese yarn, maybe something from the Amirisu Yarn Club that I am getting, I'm getting right now. I should get my second installment of that in um, before the end of my knit along and maybe one or two skeins of a Japanese kind of big box yarn. So I can send those out for the world to experience. That's kind of what I'm thinking about there. Uh, so yes, this guy is absolutely beautiful, lovely to work on. Uh, and I hope maybe some of you will knit this guy too. Uh, I don't know how you're gonna get this particular magazine, but let me give you the specs. So. Knit Marche Heartwarming Life Series, Volume 22, 2017. There you go, you got the details. There's actually several patterns in here that I'm really excited to um, tackle. I am not super adverse in reading, adverse, super up to speed in reading uh, Japanese crochet patterns, but there are a couple of lovely crochet patterns in here that I want to do, particularly this project bag here. I know I've shown this on some previous episodes, and I know I've also mentioned that in Japan, it seems like knit and crochet are not separated the way they are in the US. In the US, it's like a knit book or a crochet book, or this really niche specialty book where it's like knit and crochet together. But here in Japan, they're one and one, it seems like. I almost never pick up a knitting book that is exclusively knitting. There's usually knitting and crochet together. Uh, so I, that's my big progress. My big progress on w knitting this week is that I am still plugging away on my cross stitch project. As you can see here, we now have some trees. Um, this is the gold collection and it is just a lovely cross stitch pattern of uh, you know the aurora over I, I'd like to picture an Alaskan wilderness because there's moose and there's aurora and there's a cute little cabin and a lake and some mountains um, 
I'll probably be working on that for the rest of my life. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how we go in there. I did get asked by some viewers if I was still working on my great tapestry. And I am. It lives on my desk in this lovely yarn bowl that was a gift from a friend of mine. <clears throat> and it looks like this. Now, you guys might think, hmm, that doesn't look like a lot of progress. And it's not, but I do plug away at it. I'll pick it up and knit a couple of rows and then come back to it. But what I am excited about is um, something I mentioned in my previous episodes is I looked up how to do the jacquard ladder back um, management for stranded knitting. So as a way to keep my stranded knitting from getting too um, tight with the floats in the back. And so I've started incorporating that into this and I will show you my back side here. So before I started the ladder back, here are my floats. They get pretty long and a little unruly, uh, but overall we're doing their job. And then here is where I've started the ladder, ladder back jacquard technique. I could probably uh, add a few more in here, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, sink my teeth into it and get to experience this technique. I will say that it significantly slows me down, but I think that's because I'm using three colors across the row. I think if I were using two, it wouldn't be so bad because I just bring them both to the, um, to the front, purl my jacquard stitch, and then bring them both to the back. But as it is here, I have to like bring one forward, drop the other one, pick them up the two other strands, back and forth. Anyway, slowing me down a little bit, but I think it'll turn out really nicely. I cannot wait for this project to be done though, because I really want to um, utilize the big picture frame in my house and fill it up with some of my knitting. And I've been thinking about future um, pictures or patterns that I could do with the same sort of technique. Um, and there's one particular picture that I want to do, which will require me to carry five strands across the row. So um, I think getting to know that uh, jacquard ladder back technique might be helpful for that future project. Um, but stand by with that. I, if you are a new viewer, you probably don't know what I'm talking about here, but I have a giant picture frame, which I purchased at a garage sale for $15. It has a person's painting in it. The guy said his dad painted it. Um, there were tons, tons of these huge, huge picture frames with paintings in them. Um, my husband likes it a lot. I don't like it very much. And thankfully here in Okinawa, our walls are all cement, as you can see behind me. And I have not been able to find a command strip that is strong enough to hold the weight of this giant picture frame yet, because I've tried and they keep falling off the walls. So I have the entire time I live in this house to work on this particular project because it won't go on the walls until our next house, which is going to be in about two years when we move away from Okinawa. Spoilers, guys, if you're with me for the long haul in about two years, Haxton Knits will be coming to you from a new location. This week I have a new cast on to share with you and I am so excited. So I have cast on the Portage cardigan um, now that I am here in Okinawa, I have just been craving a, um, a cardigan to be able to throw over my shoulders when I'm inside in the air conditioning, since I am wearing my tank tops and flip-flops a lot. When I do get inside into the air conditioning, I'm often quite chilly, um, more so in my own home than out and about. Something that I noticed uh, here in Japan, they do tend to keep public spaces a little bit warmer than what they do in the United States. So in the US, if you go into a restaurant, I found I was often quite chilly um, in the summer months, in especially the southern climates where the air conditioning's running full time. Here, um, even like, you know, large offices, like I had to go to the courthouse to pay my road tax the other day, and it's just quite a bit warmer inside in those places. But um, if I am in restaurants here or whatever, sometimes I get a little chilly. So 
All that to say, I cast on a cardigan. <laughs> and this is a lovely pattern. It's a cardigan with pockets. You gotta, you can always be excited about pockets. What I really fell in love with were the colors of this cardigan. The, the sample knit is just absolutely stunning. And I really wanted something beautiful like that. I know I knock Malabrigo a lot on this channel, but I went ahead and bought some Malabrigo yarn. Um, <sighs> I'm gonna put in a clip here of me earlier this week griping, and then we'll get back to you. So I just got back from the post office and I have purchased a sweater's quantity of Malabrigo Arroyo um, in order to make a cardigan. And I know I've mentioned before, there aren't really a lot of yarn shops where I live, so I have to do a lot of mailing and shipping. And I have to say, I'm kind of disappointed. So I ordered through a company I haven't used before. And I'm not sure whether I'm disappointed in the company or I'm disappointed in the yarn or I'm disappointed in myself for not knowing better to uh, ask for same dye lots. But I received, let's see, four, seven skeins of yarn. Four of them look like this. Uh, the color's not great, I can pop some pictures in but this gold color, which is actually not the color I was expecting. And the other three skeins of yarn look like this, which is a green and gold. Let's see if I can hold these up so you can see them better. Now, to me, these guys look like two different colorways. Hold on, here we go. Here, you can see that a little bit better. So I don't really know what to do about this. Do I return them? Hmm, returning them seems like the most logical thing to do, but of course that means that I have to wait another month for yarn to come and go, which is really hard. Um, so I know, you know, we all know that dye lots vary, colors vary. Um, and I'm, I'm used to alternating skeins and things like that, but these guys are actually pretty significantly different. And my first thought was, uh-oh, I got two different dye lots. Actually, truthfully, my first thought was the company screwed up and sent me someone else's order because there's two different colorways in here. And then I looked at them and they both said they were the same color. So this is the tag for one of them. It says glitter. And so I flipped over to see what the dye lot was and stamped on it, it says, no dye lot. And so I looked at the other one, also glitter, although you can see visually that the tag is different. So obviously these came from two different time periods and also no dye lot. So am I mad at the company because they're selling yarn that says it's no dye lot, but is so significantly different or Am I mad at the company that sent me these because the person picking them out and packaging them uh, wasn't familiar enough with yarn and crafters to know that probably I would want my, my sweater's quantity of yarn to all be at least a little bit similar looking? Or am I mad at myself for not specifying same dye lot, although that wouldn't have happened, helped because there's no dye lot. So I don't know what to do. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I laid them out to see if I could alternate skeins, but the truth is the difference between the colors are so different that in a stockinette stitch uh, sort of sweater, I feel like we're gonna look like striping. And so I don't know if alternating skeins is really gonna work all that well. I guess I'm just ranting because I don't know what to do and I don't want to send them back because uh, I don't want to wait a whole nother month. It's slow, slow mail. Actually, it did take uh, 32 days for just regular uh, letter to get through the mail this this corona period timeness. Uh, how about you guys? Any of you recently ordered some Malabrigo Arroyo in the glitter colorway and want to trade yarns? So it doesn't look so shocking in this light, but in person, I mean, these are I guess it is. it's still pretty shocking. Like looking at these two skeins, you would not think these were the same yarns. And they're all marked no dye lot. So I'm kind of upset. I thought really hard about sending these back, but in the end I didn't. And I think I may regret this, but I went ahead and cast on this pattern. So my thought process is that I'm going to use this gold color for the body and the sleeves, and that I'm going to use this greener color for the, um, 
the pockets, the cuffs, and the, it's not a button band, because there's no buttons, but you know what I mean, like the, the button band and collar. Um, and here you go, living in this bag. Same pattern as before, also fabric from Takai Craft Heart. Also, I'm still totally tickled with these bags and absolutely in love with them, but I have this much knitting done on this project already. So I have just separated for the sleeves, as you can see here. I will say that I'm not, um, so the pattern's lovely, the pattern's great, the yarn is great. It's just kind of a slow going pattern. The stitch pattern on the back, it really slows me down. It is a cable um, and I am doing it without a cable needle, which speeds things up a bit, but just kind of a slow going. Um, it's not a speedy knit, which I thought it was going to be because I've been knitting so many fingering weight sweaters and this is a DK weight, although I really feel like it's kind of a thick sort of chunky DK weight. Um, but beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. It looks a little small for me, but I've heard a lot of people say that when they blocked it, that this particular stitch pattern grew a lot. So this is my new cast on. I'm, so beautiful pattern, beautiful yarn, beautiful name, makes me think of beautiful places. Yeah. I have been drinking a little today, guys. I feel like this is a theme on my channel. I'm glad you're with me today. All right, so I do have some acquisitions. I hope you're excited because it's this. So I know a few episodes back I talked about my, um, my knitting needles and how I've been using the um, Carbons needles for a really long time, the Carbons interchangeable needle set. And I love the set guys, don't get me wrong. I really love the set, but I've also had it for a really long time, maybe 10 to 15 years. And I just felt like it was time for something new. So I did buy, oh, there they go. This guy here, um, I already owned the lace interchangeable needles for this brand. And I slid that set in here. I'm kind of on the fence about whether I'm gonna keep it in this case <laughs> and what just happened really might convince me, convince me to move it out of this case. Um, I wanted to hate the case. So this case, I just, I don't love the print on it. I wish I could get it in a different kind of sleeker print. But once I opened it up, it's just, it's really nice. It's really convenient. It has all of the little pocket, um, all of the sizes labeled on there and then two rows of extra spaces. So if you already have needles, you can throw them in here. And that is kind of what sold me on keeping this all intact. Let me show you my other needle, my other uh, knitting needle cases because I love them a lot. So this is my Delic interchangeable knitting needle case. And this is where all of my carbon needles live. And so you can see this. Again, all of the spots are labeled, which I like a lot. Um, but there isn't a zipper, comp well, no, there is, there is a zipper, anyway. So yeah, beautiful. This is the Delicute interchangeable needle um, case. And it is, I think it's silk. It's just a beautiful case. There's not very much structure to it. So that's probably something I would change if I were to get another case. But lovely case that works really well for interchangeable needles. And then I have like the whole matching set. So for my fixed circular needles. I have this case here. I am not going to open it because all of those cables are just going to go everywhere and it's going to be awful, but beautiful, beautiful. And then last but not least, This guy here, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be like a little notions pouch or maybe a double pointed needle pouch, but this is where I keep my crochet hooks. I don't do a whole lot of hooking guys, but um, they live in here. I even have my Tunisian crochet hook in here as well. 
I love looking at other people's knitting cases. So you want to show me uh, your needle case, you have a really cool case that you love a lot, show it to me because I, gosh, it's like a guilty pleasure. It's like project bags. Like once you start buying them, you want more and more and more. And it doesn't make any sense because your needles are in a case. You don't need to switch back and forth between cases, but I really, really like them. The reason I don't use this case for double pointed needles is I have a silly sort of thing. Um, I don't knit with double pointed needles very often, but when I do, I never could find the sizes I wanted. And so I wanted to deal with that <laughs> concisely all at once. And what I did <laughs> was I bought this. So this is a super cheap set of bamboo double pointed needles. I'm sure it was made in China. Um, it's like, I wanna say it was 80 pieces total for less than $20. I think it was about $18 for the whole set. And it ranges from like size, I think it started at size two and goes all the way up to size 17. There's no way I'm gonna be able to open this all the way for you, but oh, maybe I will. So this is my win and need backup plan of double pointed needles. Originally I had this idea that I would use stitch markers and little labels to label the sizes, but uh, it just wasn't working. So it's a cheap set. I took a Sharpie marker to it and that is, well, I guess it's not all of my knitting needles. It's all the knitting needles I'm showing you today. I also have, you know what? I'm gonna show it to you. I think you guys will like this. Um, I think if you're a knitter of any length of time that you probably have a whole bunch of um, like straight needles, you know, like the really old straight needles. And I have a nice way of storing them. You guys are enjoying my advanced videoing skills today. Check this guy out. So this is a box for holding um, fireplace matches. Fireplace matches are just really, really long matches for starting your fireplace. And when I was in North Carolina, I went to a whole bunch of um, thrift stores and a lot of them had these. This one has a cool little lion knocker on it. I just think it was really cute. I just throw all of my <laughs> spare knitting needles, at least a few of these, here's my good video skills, are just super old, super long needles. God knows where I got them from. Uh, but yeah, that's how I store these guys. So that's it, officially, all of my knitting needles. I hope you guys aren't too bored with this particular side quest that we just went on. All right, let's move on to the life in Okinawa segment here. Oh, I have a lot to talk about today. So settle in, grab your drink. It is politics season here in Okinawa. Um, and differences. So differences between life in the U.S. and life in Okinawa. In the United States, when it's election season, it's super annoying because all of the um, candidates are running their ads on the television. And so like every single commercial is the same commercial about this candidate sucks, this guy is evil, this is awful, this is why you should vote for me, I approve this message. Super annoying. Um, but I would take that back in a heartbeat compared to the way they do politics here in Okinawa. And that's because in the US, I could just shut the TV off or just mute the TV or just look away. But here they do all their advertising with loudspeakers on the backs of trucks and they drive through your neighborhood. And I work night shift. so. My favorite time of year is politics time because all of the candidates are driving through the neighborhood and they'll just randomly stop in a location and give their speeches with the loudspeaker, whether anyone's there to listen to them or not. And that's where we're at right now. <laughs> Hopefully this will pass soon and we can just move on with our lives or I'll get switched back to day shift soon and be able to sleep through the night. 
Uh, I think you guys have probably noticed that there has been a distinct lack of beer here on this channel. I know I mentioned that I am a home brewer and I make my own beer. We have finished up the keg of beer that I made earlier, which was my Orval clone. Um, my beer making supplies have not made it to this island and I suspect it's mostly due to coronavirus chaos. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's been um, more than a month now. I think we're probably approaching 45 days of zero cases of coronavirus on this island. All of the active cases have now resolved. So basically we are in this safe little bubble waiting for a person to get on a plane and fly the illness in so that we can start our lockdown all over again. But in the meanwhile, um, restrictions are lifting. People are moving around things like that uh, but the mail has been disturbed and so it took gosh I would say probably three or four weeks we didn't receive any mail at all from off the island and then it all came at once and now it seems like onesies twosies are coming in but I suspect that somewhere in that mix the supplies I ordered for my next couple of batches of beer did not make it through. I did order an all grain kit and a um, extract kit so that I can make one and store the other one until I'm ready to make it and hopefully not have to spend any money. There isn't a local homebrew store. So yeah, there's been no beer brewing and oh well, that's the way it is. Uh, so anyway, in the interim, I have been making kombucha and kombucha is turning out great. So my last um, last batch, I decided to experiment with flavors. And so each bottle ended up with a different flavor. I did cucumber mint and strawberry mint, and I am totally shocked. Those flavors, oh, they were so good. I never thought mint would be good with kombucha. It was just kind of like, eh, I'm probably not gonna like this one. But so far, those have been my favorite flavors. And I just used frozen strawberries for the strawberry mint. It turned out beautifully, it turned out great. Um, so that's kind of a fun, cheap way to make some kombucha flavoring. The other flavors I made, I made an apple cinnamon, and I did not like that at all, honestly. I thought it was really gross. I think it was the apples I used. Um, apples here, they're not like the ones I get in the US. They're kind of big and a little bit grainy and not as flavorful. And so I think that might have contributed. I'm certainly going to revisit that flavor later on. But something about the apple and the kind of like vinegary kombucha flavor together made my brain think spoiled, like spoiled apple juice. So anyway, uh, the flavors that I haven't gotten to drink yet, I made a raspberry ginger cinnamon and an orange cinnamon and something else. I think a, an orange ginger. So we'll keep working on those. That might be a nice summertime project to work on when it's too hot to boil gallons and gallons of water for beer. So last but not least, um, I'm going to show you a little clip here that I recorded earlier. So I am coming to you from a different room in my house today and I'm just holding my camera out in front of me so hopefully you guys don't mind a little bit of wiggles here and there. I have had a very challenging couple of weeks since I spoke to you last. So um, I think my last episode came up right around the Memorial Day holiday weekend for us here in uh, in the US, obviously they're not celebrating in Japan, but still on my calendar and on my radar. Um, so shortly after that video went up, my cat Taco passed away. Um, he was an old man and he had some health problems, but it was still pretty quick and somewhat unexpected. And yeah, so, um, you know, my husband and I said that we were going to give ourselves some time and not get any more animals for a while. So. I was in my house a couple of days later alone I think for the first time and just sort of feeling the stillness in the house and and just being very sad about the fact that um, you know he wasn't there anymore and I sat down and wrote a letter to my grandmother and then I drove to the post office and picked up my mail and dropped off that letter and as soon as I got back into my car received a message that my grandmother had died and man i just i remember i was sitting in the car and thinking all i want to do is go home and snuggle my cat and lay in bed and be sad and i can't do that so instead i said screw it i'm gonna go snuggle some kittens uh here in okinawa the um 
the non-essential shopping has opened up recently since we've had 30 days or more of no cases of coronavirus. So yeah, and one thing led to another and now there are kittens in my life. Say hello girls. We do have two new additions to our family. So I want you to meet Siri. <laughs> if you're watchers of the Witcher series or players of the Witcher games or readers of the Witcher books, you'll be familiar with that character. But um, Siri is a Siamese kitten. She is such a snuggle bug. Oh my gosh, she gets like right up on your face and like suckles on your chin and I got a message from my husband that said, if I have hickeys on my face, I swear it was the cat. Um, and I get it. She's just a super sweet kitten. Unfortunately, right when we got her, she got sick. She had um, sneezing and then developed a fever. We had to take her to the vet, which meant we had to quarantine her away from our other cat. So here's a quick video. These are our two cats who have discovered that they're still in the same house together, calling to each other down the hallway, um, generally making our lives miserable for the solid week that we had to keep them separated. But in the interim, I really got to snuggle and bond with both of our cats. So this is Stoli. And Stoli is such a sweetheart, but she's super timid, like super duper timid. She doesn't want to um, explore anywhere without Siri leading the way. Like she'll literally stand at the top of the stairs and meow and cry and wait for Siri to come back to watch her come down the stairs because she's just a real chicken, but she's, um, also a sweetheart, also um, just loves to climb and our house, some of the walls in our house, um, the wall behind me here, you can't see it because it's dark back there, but it's cement, but it's brushed cement. So it's really textured and she climbs straight up the cement wall. It's, um, it's going to be a problem for sure. Uh, we've just recently purchased a floor to ceiling cat pole, which is the thing behind me. You can't really can't quite see it and some of the like suction cup cat beds to put on the windows to hopefully um, help her climb and explore a little bit more uh, I feel gosh I feel so torn talking about my joy and excitement of these kittens while I'm still feeling so sad about my cat and my grandmother passing um, my grandmother she's actually my dad's stepmother um, we called her Nanny Dickens growing up and she did, um, she had been fighting some spinal cancer for a really long time. She lived by herself. She had a, a health, home health nurse that would come in a few days a week. And, uh, I know a housekeeper that came in a few days a week and, and was very independent all the way to the end. And, um, I will definitely miss her. She was actually my last living grandparent. So sad times. Um, sad times treated with therapy kittens um gosh what a terrible note to end this on guys send me kitten pictures <laughs> send me your uh, your therapy animals so yeah it's just been it's been a challenging couple of weeks here um, thankfully everything is starting to open back up here as it is now we're um, allowed to go to restaurants as long as they have outdoor seating I don't know who would want to sit outside right now in this terrible, terrible weather, but that is life here in Okinawa. As always, I'm so glad that you joined me here today. I'm going to end it now. That's, that's I don't know how else to end it. So <laughs> I will see you next week, hopefully with some more finished objects for you. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. I look forward to seeing you guys next time.